This weekend, uh, in the process of scanning the news for stories on photographic imaging and visual culture, which I do kind of compulsively, I came across an article about how in a growing number of cities around the country, police are going to be required to wear video cameras to record all of their interactions with the public. This technology is being developed by Taser International. What you're seeing on the screen is somebody at Taser International. Taser's already embedded video cameras in Tasers, right? So if a policeman uses one, they automatically videotape the use of it. But now cops are being um, asked to wear them all the time, being turned into de facto image machines in some way, which may be a good thing because what cities that are using this technology are reporting is that um, complaints, citizen complaints against the police are decreasing. But in other ways, you could also argue it's not so terribly different than what happened when the, uh, in the 19th century when agents of the French government started photographing the communards in Paris in 1871 um, in order to build up a uh, database of criminal uh, images, images of criminals' faces. But um, these days, the use and culture and business of vision, vision machines has gone big. It's something, as I mentioned, that I think about a lot. In the last year, I started a Twitter-based project called Why We Look. Um, and basically, every day, what I'm doing is looking at the internet for stories about um, feature news stories about the changing nature, role, and impact of visual imaging as it permeates and reshapes our increasingly visual culture. I'm fascinated by what we photograph and how we perceive photographs and how we respond to the images we make and that we see, and lately what appears to be a growing desire to photograph everything all the time. Um, those interests for me were heightened in a really big way when I was working as a creative consultant at the Smithsonian for the Smithsonian Photography Initiative. This is a daguerreotype of the Smithsonian that was made in the 1840s, and people think it was used by the architect of the Smithsonian, who was Philadelphia, who was from Philadelphia, so we could go back and forth to Washington, D.C. without dragging a model um, with him, but could show people pictures of models. So in about 2004, I was invited by Mary Foresta um, to develop on-site and online programming for the Smithsonian that would draw upon the estimated 14 million photographs they've got that are housed into close to a thousand distinct collections that are scattered across 19 museums and research institutions. And it was in meeting at the castle, the Smithsonian Castle, that building about a year after that, that the idea that shaped photography changes everything, which is a book that I did that came out last year that Aperture published. Um, it was at a meeting there that the ideas for this project started to happen. In the room that day were an, a really eclectic bunch of people. There was a former contemporary art museum director, a guy named Giovanni Fazio, who's the head of the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysics Laboratory, a geographer, um, and surprisingly, an information analyst from the CIA, um, whose job was to analyze aerial thermographic images of drug dealers, cars, and parking lots to figure out when they had turned on and off their car ignitions. So it was an eclectic group of people, and what we were trying to do was talk about how photography was used by and worked for each of us. And over the course of that day, a couple of things became really clear. The first was photography was central to each one of us in the room, and what also became clear that each one of us in that room talked about, looked at, used photography very, very differently what made for an effective or an important or even a beautiful photograph depended entirely on who was doing the looking and who was doing the talking. So this is uh, one of the images. This is something that Giovanni Fazio, the guy from Smithsonian Harvard Astrophysics Laboratory, brought and showed to us. He's in charge of the Spitzer Telescope. This is a photograph of the Antenna Gallery, and it's a combination of images made by three different telescopes. One, the Spitzer that uses infrared light, so that's the red you see in the image. The other information in this is from the Hubble Telescope, which uses ultraviolet and visible light. That's the golden brown in the image. And there's also information in here from the Chandra Telescope, which makes X-ray images, and those are the blue parts of this. Anyway, what struck me after sitting around that day in the castle when, and, especially, and when I was on the train coming back to New York was the fact that in recent decades, the most sustained and promoted discourse around photography, which is a tool that's absolutely central to each one of our everyday lives, has tended to very narrowly focus on one category of images, those made as art, and maybe a handful of vernacular images that over time get upgraded to the status of art. 
And while the promotion of photography as art has without doubt helped to foster a serious consideration of the medium, it's also created something of a roadblock. As art historian Jeffrey Batchin described it, photography, a sprawling cultural phenomenon inhabiting virtually every aspect of modern life, is consistently left out of its own story because so few photographs qualify for inclusion in the history of the medium, um, which is why events like this are so terrific and so important to, uh, to do and, and be part of. But given the images that I was seeing in my work at the Smithsonian, the conversations I was having, I came to understand more clearly than ever before that conventional definitions of photography and our perspectives on photographs needed to be revisited in order to more accurately reflect the kinds of interactions we have with photographic images of all kinds. And so what I was lucky enough to do because I was working at the Smithsonian in um, kind of had their name power behind me and their, their power as an institution, an educational institution, was to go out and commission text from, by about 100 people across various disciplines, asking each one of them to describe how photography had changed their work and their lives in our world. So I got to do things like call up a guy named Yo Stam, who I had read about in Wired Magazine, who was a two-time Oscar winner who developed Maya software that's at the basis of special effects. And I asked him, I, I forget what movie I had just seen, but I was struck by the special effects and wondered how realistic, how photographic do we want special effects to be. So I called this guy up and being not from the photography world, first thing, the first thing he said in response to my question was, um, nobody ever asked me questions like this, I don't know how to respond to it. And I said, just think about it. And he did. And what he did was go look at how we think about and want to see things and talked about a 17th century Dutch painting that reproduces this roiling ocean, right? And talk about a photograph of the ocean that he himself took and then talk about special effects and what we want to see in them. And this is um, an image made from uh, special effects software that he developed, which is really based on algorithms of how light bounces off of water and smoke and uh, fire and you know air and whatever. And basically his conclusion was, we don't want things to really look photographic. We want things to look like caricatures. We don't want to see things the way that the camera sees them. We want to see them the way we expect to see them. So I thought that was like a really startling response. And it was one of many responses that the project generated that, to put it simply, radically changed my thinking and my work in photography. Um, in the past years, past decades, I've run art galleries and worked as an independent curator and writer and critic and book packager. But I've never experienced or seen a time like we're going through now when photography itself is being rethought and redefined. And when the most innovative thinking and ideas about the medium, the ones that are changing culture, the ones that are life and death issues, the ones that are changing everyday life in the most profound ways are coming from outside of the art world. It's an interesting thing for artists to have to figure out. This is a multiple by Alan Belcher, which I kind of love. It's an edition of 125 signed and numbered pieces, ceramics. They're each about 8 by 10 inches. Um, as our understanding and use of photographic images is being transformed by digital technology, we're gaining fresh and sometimes startling new perspectives on what photographs are, how they might be made, what they can look like, and where their power ultimately resides. Um, the subject of this session is, is vision machines, and while we'll soon focus on a few examples of how images are being made in unexpected places and ways, I just wanted to remind us that we're all, in fact, image machines. I'm fascinated when people talk about the power of photography, they talk about the power of photographers as creative visionaries and shapers of images. They very seldom talk about perception, and I'm fascinated by perception. There's as much to learn about photography by talking to and hearing from neurologists as there is to listening to curators or people like me or who or, or artists for that matter. Um, we're all vision machines. Our brains are constantly searching for visual patterns and anomalies. We use extraordinary amounts of energy and large percentages of our brain power to make sense of the visual data that we see every day. I was trying to find the percentage online somewhere last night, I couldn't, but it's it's somewhere like 40, it's like around 60%, something like that. Extraordinary amount of our brain activity is around vision. The human eye has 120 million monochrome and five million color receptors. The human eye has a resolution of about 30 megapixels, and it gathers information at 72 frames a second or thereabout, which makes it um, kind of more precise than even our most advanced cameras at this point. 
Um, neurologists, as I mentioned, are interesting to talk to, and they're just beginning to get a better sense of what happens to the images we see and how they're perceived and where they're stored. I came across this chart a couple of weeks ago that was a computational model by a guy named Alexander Huth, who's a doctoral student at um, UC Berkeley, because um, people are trying to figure out not only how do we see images, but how do we store images, how, and how do we then access them? And what people are starting to find out is similar kinds of images get stored in, in close locations to each other within the brain. I got at the Smithsonian, through the Smithsonian Project, to talk to a lot of people in neurology and neuroscience. One of them was a guy named Jeremy Wolf, who proposed and wrote in the book about a very simple experiment. You show somebody 16 pictures, you say, look at them quickly, give you a couple of minutes to look at them, and then you, take, you say, we're gonna show you some of these pictures, we're gonna switch out four of them and put in new pictures, tell us which ones the new pictures are. And in over 90% of the time, people can do that. They can do that immediately after they do this experiment. If you go back to them a week later, they can still tell you which the new pictures were. If you go back to them a month later, they can still tell you which ones were the new pictures. And what this kind of line of experimentation was showing was that visual memory is stronger than our memory for words, stronger than our memory for sound, stronger than our memory for touch, stronger than our memory for smell, which is something kind of amazing. So following up on this, this project, I've kind of become obsessed with the various kinds of external imaging machines that are in development and have um, already been introduced into our everyday worlds, sometimes to great fanfare and sometimes to great controversy. So you know, one uh, thing, one, one issue is about red light cameras, which if you look at newspapers is a, a legal battle that goes on around the United States virtually every day of the week. Do these save lives? Do these raise revenues for police departments? Is this spying? Um, Google Street View has for the past four or five years been a controversial issue, first in Europe and more and more in the United States. This is a fleet of Google Street Car, um, uh, Google Street Car uh, vehicles. And I'm kind of fascinated by this. I'm amazed by the process. I'm amazed by the images they make. I'm really interested in the way artists try to use the images that come off of this and am fascinated by the fact that Google Street View images are it's interesting, if not more interesting, than the works that artists make based on them. So I think we're also living in a time where ideas about photography may be more interesting than some of the images that are being made, which is something very interesting to me, at least I think, and talk about. I'm fascinated by drones. I think drones are like the weirdest and most interesting thing going. Um, and they're, they are basically unregulated. If this is a huge issue in terms of vision machines. These, you can buy them, you can buy them from Brookstone, you can buy them from your airline magazine, you can send up cameras and photograph anywhere you want. I went to visit a friend in Minneapolis when I was speaking at the Minneapolis uh, Art Museum a couple of weeks ago and she was telling me she lives on the second floor across from the Guthrie Theater. There was a parade on the street. She was doing yoga on her bed by a window and a drone went by, stopped outside her window and turned the camera and pivoted on her and she freaked out. Right. <laughs> this is Google Glass that, as many of you probably know, is under development that's going to raise all kinds of interesting opportunities and issues in terms of being able to take pictures whenever you want without touching a camera, uh, raises privacy issues, public space kinds of issues, um, completely fascinating. More recently, a couple of weeks ago, I read about this. This is called Momoto. This is a little device that you can wear around your neck or wear on a t-shirt or whatever. It takes a photograph every 30 seconds, right, and transmits it to a cloud. You get a cloud account, and at the end of the day, you've got 6,000 pictures, and there you go. Do with them what you want. The privacy issues around this are very, very, very interesting. So these museums largely create and use photographic images that are based upon the kinds of images that photography has been selectively engineered to see so far, right? And this is something else I'm interested in. Um, we think we know what photographs should look like, right? But what is becoming increasingly clear is that the photographs don't have to look the way we expect them to. There's more to see than we see, right, in terms of vision and what's to be seen in the world, and there are other ways to see than we see. So um, about two years ago, I came across an article in Scientific American that described how digital imaging was sweeping aside 
what they described as 200 years of technology and expectations based on the photochemistry of silver halide crystals. The piece tracked how imaging laboratories are experimenting with cameras that don't merely digitize an image, but perform extensive computations on and explore the possibilities of image data. Some researchers seek to improve current photographic processes. Others challenge the very notion of a photograph as a realistic representation. Computational photography is not so much about taking pictures, although it sometimes involves it. This is a setup at Stanford University for, um, to kind of gain information. It's, it's, uh, this is like Moybridge done, done big and in a very concise little space, right? Computational photography is about the rethinking and remaking about what we understand photography to be. New, techni new techniques make images by extracting information from luminous fields we cannot see. They make us aware that imaging is as much a process as it is a product, which is something else I think is interesting to think about. And that almost any kind of image you make is only one version of what that image can be. So the Photography Changes Everything project was divided into sections. Photography changes what, who we are, where we go, what we want, who we see. And I think photography also changes what we expect things to look like, including photographs. Um, last summer, and shortly after the book was published, I was looking through a bunch of magazines and came across an article about research that Andreas, who's going to speak next, was working on. And so what I'd like to do is turn the floor over to him so he can talk about some of the projects that he's been working on in terms of computational photography. So yeah, thank you for the, <laughs> for the introduction and for leading into this talk so, so, so perfectly, actually. Um, so the talk is called uh, Computational Imaging. I try to, um, like the imaging kind of indicates that what we do is a little more um, and geared towards research and, and um, scientific imaging at this point. It's probably a little bit until what I'm going to show you is going to be consumer photography. Um, but um, the kind of over, overarching theme of the talk um, is to, to explore what we can do if we go beyond this view of, of an imaging system being a lens that projects something on a sensor, and that sensor just waits until the image forms and then reads it out. So um, if we want to take an image of an object, we basically just bounce light off of it, and that light we can imagine as traveling off of that object in rays. And the, the, the rays coming from that one point on the object normally wouldn't ever meet again. So this information just kind of spreads out all over space, that, that, that uh, information about that one pixel. And even worse, like information from different pixels spreads out the same way and it all mixes together. So as you go away from the image, the data kind of blurs out and mixes together. And the lens that we put in the imaging path to do our imaging does something very curious. Because if you, um, you, could, you could view this as a kind of a time reversal. This, this electromagnetic signal that comes and hits the lens, everything that has been doing up to that point is then happening in reverse. It's almost like playing back a movie backwards, right? So um, this, this, this field does in reverse what it has been doing going there, and then of course somewhere after this lens, this light field represents the image again, right? And then all we have to do is put a sensor at that point and just read it off, right? And what I find startling about this is that the all the revolutions in imaging that we had um, in the last 100 years all deal with the readout. And I think the real magic is happening in the lens. It's happening in taking this mass of information and reconstructing an image out of it, right? And um, so lenses are really still the core technology of all our imaging devices, right? Even our most advanced microscopes, we, we just we use more of them in order to get better properties. But it's basically just a lens and we expose an image. And many of the limitations that we think are inherent in our imaging are basically properties of lenses, right? The, the reason why you can't make a nice cell phone camera is basically because you have to have a lens and there has to be a distance between the lens and the imager in order for the image to form. So um, that's a limitation. There's a limitation to the resolution that are just due to the way we, 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 we reconstruct this information with the lens. And these lenses are also not a very new technology. I actually went up and I was startled at this um, this is the oldest man-made lens, I think, as, as, as far as I know. It's called Nimrud lens, uh, based on the, on the place where it was found in ancient, it was made in ancient Mesopotamia. And this is a piece of quartz glass, same material that we have for lenses today. They found it and they shaped it 
to form a lens, probably to use as a magnifying glass. Um, but there's a lot of information that's a simple, very specific way of extracting information. There's a lot of stuff in the light that we miss by doing this, right? We only get Im Im image information from that one plane that is off in the right dis distance from our focal plane, and there's um, a lot of other information that we don't get by doing what we do with our cameras. And one of them is this, this project that, that we built in our lab. This is a photograph of a scene. It's a tomato in front of a wall. And we built a camera that is fast enough to show you the illumination process of this scene in slow motion. Right? There is no camera today that can actually do this. But it's very relatively simple in, an, in a well-equipped optics lab to capture that information and then to reconstruct, reconstruct a photo or a video from that information. And um, so what's going to happen, I'm going to play the video, and what's going to happen is the light's going to come from that little white uh, block on the lower left, and it's going to um, move across the scene. And you can see it now. This is basically a short illumination flash that creates an image of the scene. And we leave the photograph in the background so you see what's going on. And this is what happens if we take all these frames and just add them together, you get a black and white photograph of the scene. Right. And now the next video just shows you the illumination only without the photograph, and without the color photo in the background. So basically the light goes out, hits the tomato, and then it hits the wall in the back. So just to, to summarize, this is a video that's, that's reconstructed from captured data of light moving through a scene in slow motion. So this is like, like the slow motion photography that you have in, in a sports event. We just slow down things much more. This light moves a million times faster than a bullet. So, um, and, and we have an effective playback or capture rate in this video of about a half a trillion frames per second. And the entire illumination process of the scene takes place in one nanosecond. Right? So you do need a very fast capture technique in order to get this information. But once we have it, we can actually see how nature composes this image for us. We can watch the, the, the illumination transport in action. Right? We illuminate with a short flash and just see how the light interacts with the scene. And well, I'm just going to show the video again because it kind of goes over quite quickly. So uh, we have the illumination that hits the tomato. And as you can see here, the tomato keeps glowing. That's an important part of the mission. Then we hit the back wall. There's a shadow of the tomato appearing in the corner. And there's also, if you look very carefully, I don't think you can see it on this projector, but you see light that hits the wall, hits the tomato, and then in, hits back on the wall. So there's light bouncing back and forth between the object that takes part in the image formation that is usually very hard to extract. So here you can see again, once we hit the tomato, the tomato keeps glowing. And actually, the tomato becomes a light source and illuminates the rest of the scene. And that's because this tomato has subsurface scattering, right? Like in our skins, the light actually enters the object and bounces around a little bit before it comes back out. So the, the, the point of this is that all this, this interaction contains information about the scene that we can use and extract if we do it in the right way. And our mo main objective with building this camera was to use this, see whether we can build a system that can use this information about the exact interaction of the light with the scene and somehow calculate backwards and see whether we can reconstruct images of objects that the light interacted with before it entered the scene. So this is basically a camera that can see around corners, right? So this is our, um, our, our lab setup, essentially. We have this ultra-fast laser, which is essentially our flash that generates like a femtosecond long pulse and a camera, um, which is essentially the camera that, that produced the videos that I just showed you. Um, and they both look at a wall. And somewhere off that wall, we put an object that neither the laser or the camera can see because we block the direct view. And then you, you send a pulse from your laser that bounces off the wall, and then the light just spreads everywhere. And some of it hits the object and comes back, and that's what the camera looks, looks at. So the camera doesn't see the object, it sees the patterns the light creates when it comes back from the object. So it sees these weird rings forming on the, on the camera, on the wall. And it has this time resolution in order to do this and separate it from the direct light and everything. And from that information, we can then computationally reconstruct an image of the hidden object. 
The reconstruction is actually very similar to what you would do in a CT machine, in a comput computed, computed tomography. But I mean, one interesting part here, um, also in relation to what was, what was being said before of our, our brains being used for imaging, right? These two representations, the, 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 uh, the cam what the camera sees on the wall and the um, confidence map on the, on the right there, they contain the same information. It's just reordering it, right? But one of them is something that our brains like to look at and that our brains can, can, can interpret, and the other one we can't. And it does have a lens, yeah. But it, it, I mean, the lens creates an image of the wall. It doesn't create an image of the hidden object. Right? Also, the, the street camera only looks at a, at a line. Right? It can't see the entire wall at a time. It just sees a line. And that's basically the reconstruction we had to do also to get the fast videos. Um, so, and the second part um, of, this, of, this brief, um, of this brief introduction, I wanted to, to deal with another dimension of information. Here we have now talked about what we can do if we have time information in the data that allows us to ex ex extract the, the exact motion paths. Another one is um, a project that we started on a microscope, which is, this is an image of a confocal microscope um, that looks at uh, a number of fluorescent beads. They're about 10 micron in diameter. And um, this is black and white. We built a microscope that um, can reconstruct images. Even though the sensor only sees black and white, we can capture and reconstruct images in color. And we don't just see the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. This microscope actually has 15 different color channels. So if I have this color image, I can actually go at a pixel in the image and get a spectrum of the data. Right? Each, behind each pixel is an entire spectrum of, of the data that we capture. And as you can see that the different parts of the image have different spectra, basically. And there's even spectral information in these black pixels here which is kind of an interesting, interesting side effect. But um, one reason why I'm, why I'm bringing this up is now we have these 15 channels, and it's, I feel that even in, in scientific imaging, it's, it's really hard for people to look at these and make sense of them, right? We, we can only see bri three primary colors. Even adding a fourth, like all the colors that we know are composed out of three, these three colors. Even if we add a fourth, we extend our color space to something that our brain just can't process. So what do we do with 15? And I actually saw this article yesterday. There's actually animals that have 15 different color channels and can process. Um, but um, we can't. So how do we make the best of this information um, even though we, our brains never learned how to process this? And with that, I'd like to, like to summarize these two. We have this, these videos where we use time of flight. And there we actually have found a way to extract some information and present it in a way that, that that we can process. I think in these, in these um, hyperspectral images, I mean, you can do these false, false color, color renderings that, that uh, I think Marvin also showed. Um, in these false color, false color renderings, I think it's largely still um, unknown. I, I don't think anybody has come up with a good way of extracting some information and displaying it in an intuitive way so you could just look at it. And I think that's why they're kind of scientifically underused at least in microscopy and in diagnostic, in medicine and things like this. Okay, with that I would like to um, thank you for your attention and um, I'd like to... <laughs> like to acknowledge all the people that were involved in this diff many different projects that I actually kind of touched on, touched upon. Thank you. I've got a question for you to start off with. It's like, how do you start doing this work? Well, how did I start? Actually, my, my PhD work wasn't in imaging. I, uh, I, I was, the, the, there was more a measurement um, task of, of making a single pixel very accurate measurement of like one single piece of information. And um, this work was, the, the ob objective was to somehow use this time of flight information to see around corners. And the, the, the videos that I showed you came kind of out, out of this as a, as a side, pro uh, side product, 
that we, we didn't plan to make these. But what I was, what I was startled by is um, once you take this information and make a video out of it, it suddenly becomes so much more effective. It's, it's amazing how, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, we have been, this is, I mean, the time resolution is picoseconds. We do now, I mean, there's, there's systems that can, that can capture single pixels with attosecond information. That's like a million times faster still. But somehow being able to visualize this as an image is, is, is infinitely more powerful than to just people, to show people, okay, this is how it works and explain it. Somehow vision just, just um, speaks to, 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 yeah, to, our, to, to our cognitive uh, capabilities much better than, than other ways of conveying information. And I think that's where also the scientific value in it is. Yeah, I mean, what's the, what are the uses when you, you do this research, do the basic research to set something this, like this up, which seems to me a little bit like LIDAR and other uses of uh, lasers where people make images of topography, the ocean's floor, mountaintops, use it for engineering. So this is similar to that, yes? Yes. In LIDAR, um, you basically, you do what, what we do, but... Um, you send, you send a light towards the scene and you just wait for it to come back and then at each, each pixel you see, okay, how long did it take for that first light pulse to come back? And from that you can calculate what the distance was in that pixel. So you get depth information. And I, I think this is actually, an I mean, this is very similar to a LiDAR system, but it's an interesting use. Usually people just throw away this after information that we use yeah. because it, it doesn't immediately produce an image. You have to do some reconstruction. And that, again, speaks to this to this, it becomes very challenging when you actually have to look at the information and try to make sense of it without having an image in front of you. Because again, our brains are incredibly powerful at processing images compared to many other things. And so how does that start to happen? Does somebody just ascribe certain kinds of visual qualities to the light that bounces back off of that person hiding around the corner? I mean, how do you? Well, there. I think this, this idea came really evolved out of the, the things that have, have happened in the computational photography community where people really try to exploit every kind of information. And they, they already had been looking at like um, patterned illumination. What if we, if we project a scene, something in the scene instead of just illuminating with one light flash, if we project a spatial image on the scene, what can we do with that? And there was some impressive work and my postdoc advisor was involved in some of that, and this, he thought, okay, what happens if we have time as additional information? And I was kind of theorized that if, if we had that, we could actually extract images around the corner. Right. I mean, I'm interested in things like Google self-driving cars, right, which mm -hmm. are programmed with, I think, four million still photographs as well as videos and all sorts of other information, right? So they've got programmed information photographic information about what something is supposed to look like, right? And I'm kind of like, you know, fascinated with stories that I keep reading about, you know, for instance, neurologists um, studying people's brain waves while they're dreaming and now creating the images of what they're dreaming, right? And they do that based on showing people pictures in the first place to, and, and understanding brain activity as people are looking at photographs and then extrapolate that later when they look at people's brain waves while they're sleeping to kind of make up the images of what they think these people are seeing in their in their dreams. So it's just it's this notion that data becomes an image, right? And and is kind of mind-boggling to me, right? And and um so how much computation is involved in this? Like you know, how many what does it take computation-wise? For, for the for for creating these fast videos that you saw of the tomato from the data the computation is basically just rearranging the pixels because we can't take them all at once. We have to take several lines at a time and right. have to integrate. Um, for the for the seeing around corners, the computation is is essentially identical to what a com computer tomography machine does. It basically gets a lot of projections right. through the body and and computes an image. It takes like we have a MATLAB program. It takes about half an hour to reconstruct the image from the data. I, I'm pretty sure we could do it much faster. Right. If we, and when you, when you work on on projects like this, do you, is this literally like problem solving in science and physics, or is this done with potential applications in mind? There are different people that have different, um, different philosophies about this, and I've worked with both. I think if you, if you, the further you go in, into the research, as opposed to development, 
um, you get into the problem where you have to um, just explore a phenomenon and then afterwards see what comes out of it because you don't, I mean, one can't, one can't really tell in an early stage. So in this case, we just thought, okay, we could see around the corner and then we had like a lot of brainstorming and tried to talk to people to see who would be interested in such a capability, right. which actually is a, is a hard thing to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's not difficult to describe somebody here, what if you could use, what, what if you could look around the corner, but usually people don't think about that. It's, it's, it doesn't usually happen that people build this power plant or something and said, gosh, if we could only look around this corner, right? <laughs> so, but fire departments. Could fire departments, this, exactly. Right? That would be, um, th that's one application. There's one very interesting one where, we, where, we, uh, where we, we we're thinking about this, um, people looking at um, caves, discount, discovered these caves, the skylights on the moon, mm. which we don't know what's in there. So that's another interesting application where like, being able to peek around the next corner would be, would be a very intriguing. And of course, for the, for the spectral resolution in microscopy, I believe that um, there is a lot of information in these images that we still haven't figured out how to use. Because if you, if you use these in a clinical setting to make a diagnosis, you have a prescribed way of doing things, and you don't change that unless you're, you're, like, you're, you're sure it, it works for something, right? And yeah. it's, it's hard for people to look at these and, and immediately, I mean, it's, it's hard for the brain to process 16 color channels or 15. And one of the things that's interesting to me about computational photography is this notion that you can clearly manipulate what pictures look like or what you, know, what you can do with them is all based on computational stuff, like sharpening programs and whatever, right? So I was uh, also interested to read a while back about this whole notion of good enough photography, you know, that, that basically you can have... Um, take photographs that have 20% of the ultimate amount of information they might need to have, and then you can boost them back up to 95% of what information you might get if you used, like, let's say, a large format camera, right? I mean, are those kinds of issues that you work on, too, in terms of sharpening or in terms of inferring information back into pictures? That Yes. Are there? That is also, I mean, it's, that's especially interesting in, in things like microscopy where you, where, you, where you only can put a limited amount of light on your sample yeah. before you kill it or before it starts, I mean, you can't, can't wait forever because maybe they're alive and move and things like that. Yeah. And um, you re really would like to make the best use of the information that you get. And one interesting part about, about, about images that's also, also kind of a startling realization, at least it was for me, is that most of the possible images that are out there are just noise. Right? If you, if you just like, generate images of ra at random, it's very unlikely that you find, ever find anything that makes any sense. Right? So, so most, like, a camera that can capture the entire image space actually can capture a vast amount of, of possible images that we never ever want to look at. Right? So, so coming up with ways of, of measuring data in a way that, that, that is more specific to what we actually want to get out is actually, is, is, that's a, that's a in very big field in science. There's a, there's a whole field of compressed sensing trying to trying to um, come up with, 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 with devices that, that capture only the information that we need, right? Because usually we capture an image and then we compress it to a fraction of the information. So why would we ca capture the whole image in the first place? Right, so that, so that means that every discipline could have its own kind of photography based on what it was looking for or what it needed. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I was reading about um, people making movies at an atomic level, right, of proteins in cells, right? Yeah. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's like how much light can we put in this place? What do we use to record this light, you know, without burning out our specimen or whatever? But that means that every field would use photography differently in terms of the kind of data that they might look for. Yes, and then we come, of course, into the, into the area of computer vision where it's not humans anymore that look at these pictures, but like computer algorithms, maybe maybe even like you may have a computer algorithm that just comes up with a diagnosis, and you don't ever have to look at the visual data and the images anymore. Except, of course, if if you want the computer algorithm to somehow, or if you want the you want to somehow co convey a lot of information in a quick time, and then again, images are the best way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's so. I don't know. We have any questions here from the group? Um, as far as uh, reconstructing the images um, with the bouncing light, have has anyone at the lab yet kind of tried to use the concept of sonar in, compare, in conjunction with the light? So the difference between 
we, we actually tried a little bit looking at sonar and um, there, there are other people, there's actually people, I mean ultrasound is trying to do things like that in the body. The difference between light and sonar is that the wavelength of sonar is much longer and you can't consider the, so in, a, in a scene like this, you couldn't consider sonar as propagating in, in rays anymore. And you have to consider this entire diffraction pattern, which means that in order to do this kind of thing, you have to model the entire room properly. We, we kind of have the advantage that we, we hit with our laser, we hit one single point on the wall. We know our camera only looks at that other one single point, And all we have to consider is that ray path of that light ray from that one point to the other. If your wavelengths were longer, you can't do that anymore because the light doesn't propagate. It's like a wave in a pond and everything has to be included in the model. And that's the challenge when you try to do something like this with, with radar or with ultrasound. It's just a harder computational thing because you have to solve the entire problem at the same time. You can't re reduce yourself to this sub-problem of just saying, okay, we just consider this one path at this time and then look at the next. I actually had one question considering, con considering the, those, um, do you, I, I'm wondering whether, whether how our perception of, of images has changed with the technology. Because I, my feeling is that um, so far our brains have been busy with, um, we get this, this, this photo which is really an in, inferior representation of the object that we took a picture of. And our brains are really good at extrapolating from that. Right? We can look at a two-dimensional black and white photograph and we know what we're looking at, which is not obvious at all, I think. And, um, but I think the, the future challenge is more, how do we take all this, not, now our cameras have higher resolution, more spectral range, so they're better than our eyes and our brains. So how do we take that information and reduce it to something that we can look at? Or do, how, we, how do we train ourselves to process that additional information, which in a way that should be an easier task than extrapolating something that isn't there, is to reduce something if you have too much information. Yeah, I, it's a really interesting issue. I mean, one of the strangest things that ever happened to me was years ago um, when I was working at Light Gallery, it's like a zillion years ago, and trying to uh, sell photographs to people. And I remember, you know, talking to people and saying, oh, you should really look at these pictures. These are great, you know, blah, 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 whatever you do when you're trying to sell photographs. But um, somebody said to me, photographs make me nervous. <laughs> And I was like confounded. I thought like, you know, I love these pictures, you should love these pictures, whatever, right? But I, I, I never understood what this meant. And it was only years and years and years later when people started writing about the indexicality of photographs, right? That I started kind of getting it, right? Aside from the fact that people don't have to feel like they have the language to speak about photography, there's so much information in pictures that I think people literally do get nervous looking at pictures. You cannot take in all of that information. So the question you're raising is like a really interesting one. It's like, how much information do we need or want from pictures? One of the people I spoke to um, when I was doing the Smithsonian project, uh, although I never got her to write a piece for it, was a woman named Ode Oliva who's at MIT, and she does research in what's called the gist of the scene. And what they are working with there is trying to figure out like how quickly you extract the subject the information and sub about the subject of a photograph. And it happens in, uh, as you would imagine, a fraction of a second. And you can look at really, really, really out of focus pictures and identify what's there. So those, those questions you know, about how we perceive images, how much information we need, how much or how little we need, are really kind of interesting ones. And I don't know. People are not, you know, I don't know that people are looking at this yet, right? I kept, when I was working on the Smithsonian Project, I'd call up neuroscientists and say, oh, what's the difference between looking at a photograph of something and looking at the real thing? And they'd say, well, I don't know. Nobody ever asked me that question before, and that was kind of the end of it. But I think those kinds of questions are interesting, you know? And I think how, how much information we need, how much data we need or expect or want or can use from images is something that we're going to only start to figure out. I guess when there's commercial reason to do it, <laughs> or national security reason to do it, or stuff along. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I that I also ask you about, like where does this research come from? You know, because I I like talk, I like working with scientists. I think scientists are as creative as artists, and it's always an interesting kind of dialogue. And I'm working on a 
project now at the University of Maryland about photography and, and, and visual culture. So I've been talking to a lot of research scientists there. And it's always interesting to see, like, okay, where do these images come from? Where does this, where do these advances in imaging come from, right? And it's, you know, coming from homeland security issues. It's coming from ecological issues. It's, like, very interesting to see where, how, how photography changes based on the needs of various, I guess, clients and funders and whatever, which is why I was curious about how your research happened. Yeah, our, our research was really, in, in that sense, basic research in that we, we just did it because we thought we could and worried about the, the finding yeah. the, the, the nails for the hammer while we were like, working on solving the problem. Yeah. So your research that you are doing, where does the, like you were speaking to, where does the, like, the funding come from? Is this being funded by kind of government? Like what we were speaking about, like where does the core come in? Is it, is it for the advancement of just science? So is it one person kind of, you know what, is it a collective of people looking at this research? Um, uh, so yeah. This was for... It was for you. For me. Uh, okay, um, so... Well, this has been funded by different agencies. Obviously, military funding agencies are kind of interested in this. So DARPA actually did <laughs> did did fund part of the uh, the the research that I did at MIT. Um, another part is is the Media Lab Consortium, which is basically just money up front. So basically, they they're, they're members of the Media Lab and they pay the money, and you you're supposed to do with it what you think is is interesting. Um, other like this, 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 uh, this idea um, of um, uh, looking at caves on the moon. This is something that, of course, NASA is interested in funding. Mm. Um, but in terms of applications, it will be. I think in the U.S., it's mainly the Department of Energy and 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 DARPA and these, because they also, of course, do the research for like firefighters and things like that, right? It's not all all necessarily military applications. That yeah, could. yeah, which is one of the interesting things about surveillance as, as just a, another topic that involves, you know, vision machines, right, and, and the various uses of it. I mean, that's why part of why I'm fascinated by drones, right? I think the, the, the negative aspects of drones are really kind of mesmerizing, but the positive uses of them is interesting as well. So it raises, these raise all kinds of interesting issues. For this kind of basic research things, where you basically just you build an imaging system, like a proof of concept, and say, here we can see around corners, yeah. it really, the research won't change much depending on who funds it, right? You just write the proposal to the agency that you think is interested, right? So you have to, like, make it interesting to them by putting out some application that, that they, may, they, may, they may be willing to fund. And that's essentially the question of what does the taxpayer want to put their money in, right? It's much easier to convey to them Mm -hmm. for some reason that military funding is important. And when you work on something like this, then what comes next, right? I mean, once you guys figure this out, do you know, do you know what, do you work on this and perfect this further, or do you move on to other ideas around computational imaging? Um, well, I'm trying to do both. I'm, I'm, well, I have some, some projects now that, that are more dealt with dealing with microscopy and medical imaging, so I'm trying to move in that direction. And following up on this, uh, it, I, I'm really interested in, in, in seeing how, how far we can push this idea, how, how, whether we can make this work in a, in a real room-sized environment and kind of being part of that development. But on the other hand, I think the main, the main creative process is always coming up with new things, um, with new things that, that nobody else is thinking about at the, about at the time. I think I, I find it I find it much more much more rewarding in a way to 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 make suggestions and bring up ideas that I think people wouldn't have followed if, if this suggest, suggestion wasn't made. There's many fields in science where you have like three or four competing groups where you would say, okay, if I don't do it, somebody else will do it anyway. So so why would I even? <laughs> but. Um, so I, I, it's, 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 it, I think it's very rewarding to, to have this idea that you can come up with and, and, and make a suggestion where you think, okay, this wouldn't have happened if I hadn't done this. Right, right. Yeah, I'll start? No. So um, it's kind of difficult to explain, but I'll try. Um, we are approaching the whole thing through um, the technological side of it, right? Um, I want to ask you, uh, 
to both of you guys. Um, we have the technological part and then we have the media part. What I'm interested in, how the two are basically related. So somehow we are coming to a point, I was reading some kind of article, I don't remember where, and um, the author was saying basically we are gonna arrive to a point in where we are not gonna be, um, it's not gonna be necessary for us like to take a picture because we have such a database with thousands of this thing we are trying to shoot. So basically our camera is gonna be more of a black box. We just push the button and the camera is gonna like geolocalize us and give us the best result uh, going through Flickr or whatever or Instagram and finding what we are trying to shoot. Because we don't really need to shoot it because probably if we are trying to shoot, I mean, let's say the Tour Eiffel, we have thousands of Tour Eiffel all over, right? So why do we need to shoot it? Maybe because we have someone we care about within the image. So it, it comes again to a personal point. And also, I'm kind of brainstorming myself. And also, um, relating to ourselves, let's say, we, with this kind of media and social media um, explosion, we always give an image of who we are to the world. So little by little, it, it's kind of also useless somehow to see ourselves uh, you know, because we constantly give an, out, an image output of who we are, right? Through our social media feed, which is more and more and more becoming an image, a visual social media feed. It started out maybe, you know, Twitter is more of a textual thing, but now with Instagram, Vine, and all of that, it's becoming more and more of an image data thing. So it's really interesting because you're working on this subject from the technological perspective, and you're seeing how can we recreate an image of something not having the image, you know, or having a different kind of image and re-elaborating what we have. And what I'm interested in, and maybe Marvin is more on this kind of thing, is how can we recreate an image of something that um, is already being represented somehow, somewhere, and it is constantly without any need of representing it, because our society is coming to this end. How can we re-elaborate this kind of thing and how the whole thing is going to go? It's really something I'm, I'm wondering, so it's... It's even difficult, as I said, to explain, but I'm, I just feel like um, we constantly give a representation of ourselves, and it's because of medias, because medias like 20 to 30 to 15 years ago, they weren't like how they are now. So uh, it wasn't that necessary to give a representation of everything we, we give right now. Yeah, it's, listen, I mean, those are the kind of issues that have been around at least for the last 40 years is like kind of fuels pictures generation work and, you know, like why make pictures, right, anymore if there's all these pictures out there and like if the technology exists to make pictures of everything also, like why bother, right, and or what do you learn from the process, which I, you know, I'm, I think what you learn from the process is personal and, you know, as you're saying, it's what you choose to see in images. But I think part of what fascinates me is that we're living in a moment where, like, all of this technological change is really changing photography and it's changing what, what images are, as we've said, how we use them, how we share them, whether we bother to take them or not take them, as, as you, you, you said. So I don't know that there's an answer, you know, to your question. I mean, I teach in a bunch of MFA programs. I, you know, I start off every year thinking, like, why are they here? Why am I here? Like, what are we doing, right? Where is this all going? And I don't know the answer to it. But I think that what's most interesting, or one of the things that's interesting to me, is that photography maybe in the past was more about you know capturing something, making an object that represents it, right? And um, that activity and the discussion around it, it's changed as technology has changed not only images and how they're made, but how we use them and how we think about them. And so people are communicating through images in ways that they never did. So I think you, know, you kind of have to watch all of that you know, and, and see what that means. But I don't know, who knows where that's all going. Um, yeah, if, you know, we, I guess we could have known from Flusser, uh, uh that the technical image was the result of programs, and so therefore photographs were also data visualization, right? But if there were any doubt about it, computational imaging seems to teach us that everything's data visu visualization uh, as it, when, it, uh, when it approaches us as an image. My, my question is uh, sort of following on the question about funding and the turn towards a conversation about uh, research agendas, um, how do we uh, get back uh, into a consideration of image processing 
uh, the socio-historical aspects, which undoubtedly have to inform the very categories which make an image legible, right? Um, the uh, sort of the whole history of visuality, which is, I mean, arguably also a history of uh, racialization, a history of various forms of social transformation, in which there's a constant feedback loop between the creation of images which circulate as legible, processes of seeing, and real historical processes and lived experience, that all these things sort of operate simultaneously and inseparably. Now it seems like we can sort of formally approach information and uh, discern various categories and strategies to create images which uh, are outside of history, outside of culture, because um, well, somebody's going to discover it, so might as well be me, right? Or, um, you know, it doesn't really matter who funds it, the research agendas are going to be the same. I think, uh, to me anyway, that seems like kind of a mistake. Um, it seems as if uh, I'm in a category mistake, because it posits a conversation about image processing and visuality, which is outside of history and politics, and I'm just wondering if you have any comments on that. So, well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, one, one part of, as, as you described, is that, that the imaging, when, once we start computing images, we don't, we don't necessarily image, just take a photo of a real scene anymore, but um, we, can, we can make images that, that are, that are that, 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 that images of something that doesn't actually exist in the real world. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think there. Well, there is. I think. Oh, I don't know. You want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> I got lost in the question. It's a very complicated question. So I feel like I mean the the even though there there are the, these images. I mean, if you take a photograph, there is a it, it is it is it, even though the photograph is not of course a perfect representation of the scene. There's a well-defined process of what it is, right? I mean, you know exactly. I mean, there is there is kind of. Yeah, so, so I'm saying that, you know, photographs, it's been shown, have uh, film stocks uh, and the lighting uh, systems which produce photographs have a normativity about race built into their uh, operations. That's not legible to people because we don't really know what a photograph is or how it works. We don't actually think of them as uh, data displays or data, data visualization that has a politics, that has a history, and is therefore doing work. Uh, you know, in forming a sociality. So it's possible to look at a photograph and think you're looking at reality when actually you're looking at image processing, right? And so if we continue to deploy categories without sort of locating them in a socio-historical space and understand that they have a politics in the way they enter back into their functioning in the world and their creation of representation and practices, then we're re being kind of naive about the categories. Well, I mean, I think your your point's an interesting one. There were there was um, talk a couple of like about a month ago about the formulation of color film, right? And what and I think it was about Polaroid color film in South Africa, right? When Polaroid realized that they had to like boost um, the chemistry, right, to more accurately represent tonal color, right? And those, that, I mean, that's like a really interesting issue, right? It's like, what kind of data do we read, right? What kind of, how do we define photography? What do we want to see, right? Um, that's a really interesting. And what don't we want to see? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, that's a really, really interesting question. And again, it speaks to how the definition of photography changes, you know, as we move forward. It's like, what does this mean? If you can see something, you know, think about medicine before x-rays, right? I mean, you know, these, all these things that we didn't see, we don't see, we don't know about, you don't look for, maybe you don't want to see, right? And so how does photography you know, reflect cultural um, attitudes or desire, right? It's a perfectly interesting question. How that, where I guess somebody would have to like literally make that the work, right? And start raising those issues, right? It's a really interesting, it's a really interesting point. But it kind of, kind of, um, kind of 
lessens these worries a little bit about computational photography and where you say it's all like uh, you can Photoshop everything. Basically this point that it's already, I mean, there's already kind of quite a bit of Photoshopping and engineering going into any photograph we ever took, right? But even, even then, I mean, we, we still know the compos chemical composition of the photograph and I mean, we can, we, can, we can look at the process and see how it falsified the images. We still, what, what, what I wanted to say is, is there's still a well-defined physical process that leads from the real scene to the image and we can follow that back and see what happens. Whereas we could, like if you make a painting, right, that just really comes out of the, the, the mind of the artist that, that drew it, and we don't really know. I mean, the, I mean of course, the painting itself is, is physical, but, but really the image must not necessarily, there must not be any representation in the real world of that image that that, that person painted or that you did, that you photoshopped. Um. Is it okay for me to? <laughs> uh, the conversation is really interesting right now, so I hope I'm not leading too much away from this. But I think something that's kind of present in all this conversation but hasn't really directly been talked about yet is the kind of idea of flatness and how the photographic process is really just taking something that exists three-dimensionally in the real world and putting it in two dimensions and also giving it a frame. Or kind of in the, the previous conversation, they were talking very briefly about how Tumblr maybe creates this sort of borderlessness of photography where it's a collection of kind of discrete images becoming one image, but that's another, maybe another conversation. But I'm, I don't have a specific question, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about this kind of process of pushing things together in this kind of simple, discrete space that maybe they had this kind of more physical distance and they had sort of more of a sculptural quality. What does that mean, kind of both technically and socially? For instance, like I, I went to the David Zwerner Gallery yesterday, and they have uh, the Thomas Roof sh show there, which has all these huge, kind of juicy painterly images of the moon, which I don't even know if he took or how he made those, created those images. But they have 3D glasses where you have one eye is red and one eye is green, and the images have that kind of strange quality. That when you look at them with your naked eye, and then when you with the glasses, they become this more kind of sculptural, three-dimensional uh, object, and you can move around, and then they kind of interact with your positioning to them, which is another interesting way of looking at a flat image and reactivating it. Anyway, this is just an extended kind of, I just was wondering what you think about flatness in terms of both technical and social imagery. It's just one way to make and look at photographs. It's not, you, it doesn't have to be that way. What you were describing, you know, and what we were talking about before about using light to figure out the topography of things, you don't need to make flat images anymore, right? I mean, 3D printers are going to make, you know, what's a photograph anymore, which is a whole other discussion. That's certainly not what we're here to do. But I think that once you kind of take the data that you can assemble, the kind of things that Andres is talking about, you can make things any shape you want to make them. You know, it, it's part of why you're seeing shows about photography and sculpture. It's like part of why, you know, it, they don't have to be these things on pieces of paper. They don't have to be necessarily things on screen. I mean, you go back to, um, you know, virtual reality and all the interest in that about 20 years ago, there'll be recreations of three-dimensional space based on photographic images that you'll be able to, you know, walk through and do whatever you want. So I think we're we're just on the cusp of that. It's and you know, it's all this emphasis on 3D TV and 3D movies and you know all of that. I think the flatness of photography is kind of magical and was really useful, right? And m will continue to be, but may not be the only way that images exist in the world. It's it's actually it's relatively easy to make stereo images, right? It's the problem of displaying them is there. And, but even even stereo photography is not perfect in terms of representing, right? Because you're missing parallax and motion cues. So you can you can now get closer to the actual three-dimensional object. And we don't see 3D, right? We see stereo 2D. We, we can't actually see three-dimensional space. So if you take two images, you're getting very close to to the to the, the, the amount of information that our eyes are taking, apart from the focus and the, when we move our head and things like that. So uh, I think you can basically make a closer and closer approximation. And at some point, maybe you get to the point where, where you say, okay, the, the difference that is left is so small that we don't have to care anymore. Uh, one more right here. Yeah, I was gonna comment on the question, I guess two questions ago. I think that photography is inherently uh, biased, exclusionary, sometimes inclusionary, and there's no real way to police or do any sort of governing of that process so like I, I sort of understood what he was asking about 
um, about the problems that are inherent with photography, but no matter what's made and no matter how it's made and no matter what technology is used, ultimately it's about snippets of time, it's about a limited view into something, it's about a context that's either loaded or erased, and it can be one or the other, depending on who authors the photograph. So I think with technology expanding, there's no real way to somehow neutralize uh, the way that it functions in society. I think it's going to be inherently biased, inherently loaded, and ev everything that you listed, uh, there's no way to remove any of that it, going forward whatsoever. I think it's just going to be part of the deal. Right, no right. No matter what happens. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that that's the biggest challenge, and it's like off topic, right, to this vision machine yeah. thing. But I think it's the growing recognition and understanding of that which is why this the whole kind of conversation around how we talk about photography and teach photography is usually important. I mean, one of the big things for me in doing the Photography Changes Everything project was understanding issues around visual literacy and how people don't talk about this. You assume photography is this neutral thing, and you know most of us in this room, I think, would agree that it's not, but it's not something that gets talked about, and it absolutely needs to be in the same kind of way that you and your work are looking at a certain kind of image and using certain kind of tools to make that image you know we all do right and so how images get made and used and, and you know to good and bad purposes or indeterminate purposes is something that needs to be talked about more more and more so I think you know your point is like a is, is a really good one and, and then one more final thing it's sort of on a surface level but sort of entertaining and interesting to think about so the bending of optics around corners it would seem that the military and uh, police are the ultimate customers for that sort of technology. I mean, I, I know firefighters would be third probably, but I would think about drones that could see around corners before they make an action or also, I mean, I think infrared photography would maybe compete a little bit with it, but there's surely applications where seeing around corners would suit the military. Are they the largest funder of that sort of research? I, I would seem that that would be the case. Well, these military fund, they also fund like things like health research and things like that. So the, mil yeah. the military funders are just the largest funders in the country. Um, right now, I think, well, when I was working on this, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't dominated by military funding. It okay. was really mainly Media Lab consortium funding. And I think half of it was DARPA, and I think the Army also was involved in it. But they usually stay away from the actual research, right? They, they, they want a, a proposal and they, they, they are happy as long as some results come out of it. They, yeah. are, they are happy with funding. And they also, like for example, the, I think a large part of the breast cancer research in the US is funded by the military, right? Because they have the money and they, they decided that that's a good thing to, to fund. Then um, they, they, they do these th kind of things as well. Um. So, so the actual project that we that we have been thinking about and working on is a space ex exploration project, and that's because I mean this is kind of kind of a thing that has to happen. People have to get together, right? And you have to have the right <laughs> opportunity to apply for. Um, the the focus, and I think there's again there's a lot of considerations. You you could, for example, think of putting this on a car, right? To, for collision avoidance, like basically just a warning if somebody's around the corner that you don't turn. But the problem is somebody, somebody. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to pay fifty thousand dollars more for your car for this feature. So it, it there's there's also it's, it's, the problem is that you that you have to go in the order of what what will be possible, and um, what will people be able to. Pay for example some, something something that the fire department can can finance like if they have well, like if the city of New York had one fire truck that has this feature that's something that's reasonable because you can put like you can build a large system and something and that's something that's possible and that's um, something that we are following up on but the 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 um, the context right now is I think the funding is more um, space research funding. Which in, in in the end is again it's a simulation of what will happen. So it really isn't is doesn't matter whether we think of caves on the moon or we think of, of firefighters or we think of a of a of a, 
wor worst scenario. It, at this point in the research, it is, it is so ambiguous of what we would do with it that it, that it really doesn't matter what the application is we're thinking about in the end, which of course I'm hoping um, will be, I mean, it's, it, and it's, it's, it's not an offensive, to, you, can't, you can't really kill anybody by being able to see around the corner, right? And you can't even, I mean, it's also, if you're worried about it, just like put the blinds down, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, it's, not, it's not such a superpower that it, it, it will give you kind of a low resolution. I mean, you saw, the, you saw the, the, the reconstruction. It gives you kind of a low resolution idea of that there may be something there. I think there are probably much, much, much more effective ways of spying on people. Well, I mean, that's a funny thing because I was uh, reading about um, people who are manufacturing clothes that are kind of filled with le uh, with metal uh, fabric, right, to stop drones from photographing you. So you can buy like hoodies that will protect you from being seen by drones at this point. So and I, this, you know. this, I mean, the, I mean, I, I completely agree that this ambiguity of, of imaging and this capture is a big concern with privacy, and, and we, we talked about the rights already. I think that this, this seeing around corners, I mean, if it, if it would get to a point where that would actually be a concern, from the research side, that would be, that would be actually really great, because I don't think the, 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 the resolution is ever going to be, and the, it's, it's ever going to be that easy. Like, in most places, you just put a mirror there, and you can see around the corner, right? So it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, these kind of issues, these these kind of questions, are what's fueled all the controversy around red light cameras and all the Google Street View stuff too. It's like you know, should you be able to look into somebody's window on the second floor of you know this street in Berlin, right? It's uh, those are the, we're, these are more and more issues like this are just going to keep coming up. And this maybe comes also to a comment about about like falsifying and photoshopping images, right? There's always I think um, you can with, with all these things you can you can you can use them uh, for good or evil, right? Like any superpower, you um, and it's <laughs> it um, it really depends on um, I, I think it, it, well it's kind of pushing off the problem, but it's it's more of a problem of 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 how society decides to use these things, right? And it's a problem of educating people that this is the things that can be done and really having a discussion about how they should be used and how they shouldn't be used. Because it's always, um, you, have, you have, like with these new possibilities and with these new opportunities that come up, you also get the means of, of detecting them and, 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 and um, acting against them. Or you get, you got alternative things, right? If you, I mean, usually you can detect if somebody photoshopped a picture unless they do a really, really great job. Um, and at the same time, uh, well, well, you just have another picture. I mean, there are there are means of of, of proving that something happened that 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 are not photoshoppable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So so there's always this way. I mean, it's it's like it's just the, the role of the photograph as this ultimate proof of okay, here I was there, is <laughs> just gone. I mean, you have to have to use something else for the ultimate proof. You just have to adapt and rise to the challenge. I think in some ways. We uh, we'll take we'll take one more question and then. We will end. <clears throat> okay, this will be my last for the day. Uh, I, I just want to say um, that I, I find it really interesting and, and somewhat troubling, obviously, that um, when we look at these images of computational imaging, what we see around the corner is a military industrial complex, right? I mean, Ariel Azoulay uh, has taught us very well and very clearly that the photograph doesn't begin and end with the photograph or the photographer. That photography is implanted, you know, in the social in a very complicated way. And well, I'm not going to like recapitulate her, her work at all, but but that it's it's much more than just the image or, or the photographer. Um, and that there's a whole sort of modality of reception, which is often tried controlled by habits of use or institutions. I mean, you comment about the limits that art history and and art reception of photography is placed on our understanding of what a photograph is. So I, I would just like to sort of say one more time that the reception of not only photographs, but, inf but photographic genre and photographic distribution channels exists in the socius, and there's a social, historical, and political stake in understanding how these things are and what they operate. So I'm agreeing with you that we don't necessarily know how to interpret images, but it's not just about detecting Photoshop. It's actually thinking about the so social and political uses which technologies that are considered normal and evolving in a neutral environment are being put to. How do we sort of call into question these functions uh, in other ways? And, and part of what I suggest is precisely by politicizing this, the context for the discussion of photography and the institutions which uh, actually disseminate and control photography. And that's something that kind of resonates in all of, 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 of science and all of technology and probably in any, anything anybody ever does. 
um, in terms of in terms of like any, any change we, we we have in our world. It's and I, I, I just like when you talk about this, I kind of keep remembering this anecdote about like you know how how this is operating systems now has this facial recognition as a login mm -hmm. that it recognizes your face and that you don't have to type a password anymore. And there, I think there's this anecdote that's being told. There was a company, and I, I'm not I'm not going to say who it was, but they, they, they used their staff and their members to train this algorithm to detect faces. And when they released the product, it came out that it didn't detect Afri African Americans. It, it just wouldn't work on them because then it didn't have any African Americans in their staff. They used to induce it. So that, that was a big scandal. And that's kind of, I think, um, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's somewhat related, but it also says, okay, it's not just the photograph. It's also like the way of analyzing the image and it's uh, these biases and, and in this case, the bias wasn't intentional. The bias was, well, it was just the fact that they didn't employ any, any, any black people, which is not a good thing, but it's also not something that they planned to do, right, obviously. So but, it's, but, it's, but it shows that the social is built into the programming, right? It shows very clearly and incontrovertibly, actually, that social assumptions about what's normal and what counts as reality are built into the programming, and, that, and that's what I'm getting at. Exactly. It's a representation of the, of the, of the, of the composition of their study group of their workforce, of the people that they use to test. And they probably did, just didn't think about that. Maybe people of different races would like, look different to this algorithm and wouldn't detect it. But of course, it is a representation of how their study group was composed and probably a representation of how their workforce is composed, which is, again, it's a deeply social issue. But it resonates into this imaging problem. And, and these, these things are, of course, very complex, connected, connected all in a very complex way. Right, and I think you know that issue that you're raising is one of the central issues. I mean, it's why there's a conference like this. It's why there's all the different people who are coming and speaking in this. But if you look around, right, and you look at where dialogues around photography can happen, right, then you've got to start raising questions like this and say, where can this dialogue happen, right? It doesn't happen in the media. I mean, it happens in the media more than you think, right? When I'm looking for these Twitter stories, right, and I'm like looking, for, you know, like many, many, many sources, these kind of issues get raised repeatedly, but they get raised in the business section, the technology section, the politics section, the news section, the art section. The problem is there's no place for people to be talking about this, or there's not enough of a place. And so I think your issue is a really, you know, the point you're raising is a really good one. It's it's something certainly that universities, higher education's got to deal with. K through 12's got to deal with it. I think museums have to deal with it. I think that there are no, part of what was great for me to be able to do that Smithsonian project was I was able to sit down with people in all these different media, right, in all these different worlds and say, how does this work for you? And clearly, as you're saying, there's like no simple story about any of this. There's no, you know, there's no single story about photography. The question is where and how do we continue to explore something like this and who's going to take leadership positions in our field, right, to make sure that these kind of discussions happen and where does, you know, where does it happen? So this is like a great place to do it. There's not a lot of stuff like this going on in this country. There's way more of it going on in England and Holland and, you know, everywhere else. It's time for people to step up to the plate and figure out a way to start talking talking about these kind of ideas. On that note, <laughs> thank you, Andreas and Martin.